Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction Book Review Podcast. My name is Luke Burridge and this is the show where I review every single science fiction book that I read as I read it. There's no set schedule, it's just whenever I finish the book I do the review, stick it up here on the podcast feed for everyone to download and listen to. And today I'm going to be reviewing a book called The Killing Moon uh, by N.K. Jemisin, an author who I've read uh, a few books of recently um, in the Broken Earth trilogy, but this is not part of the Broken Earth trilogy. This is Dream Blood number one, Dream Blood number one, which is a trilogy, I think a middle trilogy. So um, actually, I should probably have just um, looked at it here. Yeah, so N.K. Jemisin, she wrote the um, Inheritance trilogy and the Dream Blood trilogy, and then the um, uh, Broken Earth trilogy. And this is the first book of a series that I haven't tried out at all. I uh, read the first book, or listened to the audiobook of the uh, of the first book in the Inheritance trilogy, and mostly enjoyed it, but was kind of turned off quite a bit by a very um, uneven and misjudged audiobook narration. Um, but otherwise it was pretty good, but it just didn't really feel like the kind of book for me, or the kind of fantasy for me, even though it was pretty good. Broken Earth, we've talked about uh, that quite a bit recently. I thought the first book was very good, the second book was also good, the third book I felt a little bit disappointed by. But overall, mostly a good series. Any issues that I have, it just did knock out my... uh um, my own, knock down my own enjoyment rating of it, but it's nothing that I wouldn't recommend to anyone. At, uh, uh, it, it, it's not a series that I would say, no, don't bother reading it, or don't bother reading through to the end, because I think things that I didn't like about it, I think most people would be fine with, or, um, you know, there's plenty of other stuff in there that you can enjoy. So here we go with the Dream Blood uh, trilogy, which is the second trilogy. I guess she, uh, N.K. Jemisin, mostly writes, writes in trilogies. And this, uh, the the Goodreads blurb is this paperback, uh, 418 pages. Um, it was like about 12 hours as an audiobook. And uh, The Killing Moon, uh, published uh, 1st of May 2012. Um, I guess, yeah, so 2012. Uh, Literary Awards, Nebula Award nominee for Best Novel, nominee for Best Fantasy Novel at the World Fantasy Awards, and some other nominees. Um, and, uh, yeah, in the ancient city-state of Gujarat, peace is the only law. Upon its rooftops and among the shadows of its cobbled streets wait the gatherers, the keepers of this peace, priests of the dream goddess. Their duty is to harvest the magic of the sleeping mind and use it to heal, to soothe, and kill those judged corrupt. And, uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a fantasy series, uh, fantasy um, book set in, it says, the ancient city-state of Gujarat. And the front cover of the uh, audiobook here, yeah, 12 hours, 38 minutes, it says here, narrated by Sarah Zimmerman. And it's got the killing moon. There's a big moon above a city, kind of on some rocks. And I understood all the time that there was a desert and then there was a... a, a a, a valley and a river flowing through there and the river is kind of all like long and winding and I was like oh I guess kind of like some you know it goes out to some uh, uh, a um, what am I trying to say like an estuary and it's like a slow moving river and they say oh if you take the river it takes 10 days to get between this city and that city but if you cut through the desert it only takes 4 days so the desert route um, is a little bit more tricky less luxurious because you can't just take a barge uh, but there it is and it was only when I actually looked here on the uh, on Goodreads I was looking over here because it was, it was maybe a week ago that I finished reading this. I was like, oh, let me just look up the names and see what some other people think about this. And uh, someone said here, um, she has crafted a world set in a desert culture. This is Jenny from Reading Envy. I think Egypt, but on a different planet, with a magic system that combines elements of, of um, Egyptian medicine and Freudian, Freudian dream theory. And I, to be honest, I didn't pick up that this was meant to be Egyptian-inspired only until I, you know, kind of looked some stuff up later. I was like, oh, yeah, I guess there is sort of like, you know, you get the death goddess and all these other kind of things. And the the magic is based on different, um, what are the, the four humours of the body? The, the blood, the bile, the... Um, uh, what, are, what are the other? There's four of them. Anyway, so... Um, so, but you also get dream blood and dream bile and dream stuff. And these are kind of magic... Um, substances that can be harvested from bodies and if you take too much you die and all that kind of stuff but I know almost nothing at all about ancient Egypt religions and uh, different uh, cosmologies and things like that except you know for the pictures of the masks that you see and the uh, you know some different statues of this and statues of that and you see the the hieroglyphs and things but I didn't really pick up on that that was what it was from the book and I'm wondering if that is good world building that I enjoyed the story enough 
as it is, but I do think there is a lack of world building in this book, which didn't really get in the way of the story so much, but like for a lot of the time it's sort of like, oh, we're going to this place and there's these things up the coast and then we're going to this building and there's a palace. So is it called a palace? And there's a, a king with a thousand wives and he's got his favorite wife, but then there's a thousand others. And I never really tied it all together to work out that this is Egyptian influenced. It just felt to me um, like it was hiding it, it, the, the uh, N.K. Jemison's almost hiding the influence a bit too much. She didn't just want to say, look, the palace is like the Valley of the Kings and there was some, you know, there's some pyramids in the background, but that was before, you know, pyramids from ages ago, you know, thousands of years ago or something like that. If there'd have just been a few more hints about what was going on here, or maybe the, the goddess has a, uh, uh, you know, a head of a scarab and this other one has a head of a fox and this other one has a head of a cat or whatever, um, it would have kind of clued me in a bit more. Maybe I would have been able to use my own influences, my own knowledge or my own, the images that I have from ancient Egypt or fantasy kind of settings like that. Um, no, not fantasy, real life settings to kind of fill in the gaps that I felt were there in the fantasy settings. But maybe not. I don't know. It is it is one of those strange things that is it a strength of the world building that it stood up without it or was it too vague and I didn't quite pick up on that. So the... Um, the setup is, yes, you've got these different characters uh, called the Gatherers, and they go out and they, um, like it says, it says here in the blurb, they gather the, uh, uh, they, uh, what is it, the duty, uh, the duty is to harvest the magic of these sleeping mind and use it to heal, to soothe, and to kill those judge corrupt. From what it seems, it, it just, it, like, it starts off with someone failing to do this. The idea being that you can take their dream blood and uh, their other dream substances, their dream humors, and collect them into the body if you're a trained gatherer. And then, in return for that, it does kill them, but in return for that, you make sure that their soul heads on into the uh, into the, the good afterlife rather than to the annihilation afterlife or the bad afterlife. So you're sending people, get people straight to heaven, into paradise rather than into Hades, hell, limbo, uh, whatever like that. So in exchange for living in this city of Gujarat, like there is peace and everyone is looked after. And if you've got some, if there's something ill, you go along to see the sharers. There's the gatherers and I think the sharers or something. The sharers will share with you some things and heal you and make you peaceful and all that kind of thing. Meanwhile, um, the, the thing that heals that uh, or the the, way, the reason you can be healed is that somebody else has, has um, given some of their uh, dream blood as they've given their life, and you know the kill the judge, the, kill those judge corrupt is the idea of being. It's like it's not just if you're terminally ill or really old, you will be gathered. Um, so it did make me think of a bit of. Uh, uh, those uh, all those stories which it starts off and you're like oh this is a uh, we're living in a utopia and utopia and utopia and you're sort of like oh Soylent Green is people and you realize the utopia is powered by the suffering of other people or the deaths of other people so there was this tension there it's like is Gujarat a good place and are the gatherers good or are they bad who are they working for um meanwhile I it felt like, it, again, it felt like that's what it was aiming for. Like, oh, is this a good system? Is it a bad system? Are these people doing the good thing to, to work within the system or the bad thing? As we sort of see some outside views. But there was never a moment where I thought, oh, this is actually going to end up really well. And again, as the story went through, maybe I was wanting a bit more complexity in this question of like, is it okay to kill old people to make young people healthier? Because that's kind of what they kept on... That, that the characters kept on discussing and playing with there. And I was like, there is only really one way to make this sound good or to make, you know, the, it's not only one way to make it sound good, but there's ways that this tension can work or not work. And uh, it was, I never really felt like that tension paid off within the story. Um, in a way, which was kind of disappointing because it felt like at some point they were setting up like, oh, there's going to be a really complex turn. And later on, again, I don't want to go back into it. It's like, oh, these people are actually working here and there was too much effort going in there or going. And I was like, oh, this is going to really pay off. And then it's kind of dropped and they and the main characters go off on a different adventure. But I was like, wait a second, that's the main thing. Why is this? Why is not I don't know. It, it. I just felt like it was setting up a story which I thought there was going to be more conspiracy and more like unveiling of this, you know, really bad system and really dystopian system 
but in the end, it was sort of like, oh no, there's a bad guy over here that we're going to fight, and we need to fight that that you know fight that bad guy. And once that's solved, everything's solved. And I was like, but go back a bit. There's all these other layers that seem to be skipped over. Now I do understand that this is the first book in a trilogy, and maybe that is played out throughout the second two books, or the you know the second and third book. Um, of this trilogy and that those issues are kind of played with a bit more but it felt a little bit wrapped up too neatly and the things that we hinted at here it either makes the people involved monstrous that they're going along with it or naive and I think there's a lot of naivety in here um but yeah it's it's tricky uh, again it's just that satis- is it, how satisfying is it what, what is the satisfaction level of the story and it promised more than it delivered however I also think there's places to go, so if I do get round to reading on in this trilogy, if I feel like it, you know, if this sits well with me, and uh, in a few months' time I'm like, oh yeah, let's check out the next book in this series. If I do that, I do see it has a place to go. It, I think if it had all been wrapped up in this book, maybe it would have been a bit too neat. Right, let's go back to Goodreads. What does it say here? Original title, The Killing Moon. Um, yeah, characters. Ahiru, Nuriji, and Sundani. This is why I went over here, because I wanted to uh, get some of these names and some of this terminology. Yeah, so you've got the the master gatherer called Ahiru, uh, Ahiri, Ahiru, and um, and his apprentice, Nijiri. And Nijiri is like 16 years old, and Ahiru is the old one. And what my main thing that I really liked about this book is this way that Nijiri um, looks at his relationships, and you see this kind of like, it's a, um, a master um, learner, uh, relationship, but it's also kind of, they call each other brothers, oh brother this, because they know that, Najiri knows that once he also becomes a full-fledged gatherer, they're going to be, you know, comrades in arms, so there's a very, you know, th- there's a kind of equality there, but there's also like a father-son kind of thing, because he's younger and a hero is like 20 years older, and then there's like this very close, intimate not so much like lovers, but you know, there's a very close love relationship there. And I really enjoyed this playing out of this relationship between the young, naive kid and the older, um, the older gatherer teacher. Um, a lot of it is based around the idea that in the first opening chapter of the book, Ahiru messes up one of these gatherings and is sort of like having to kind of pay for that in his own way. Like, you know, he's he's, regret, he's regretting it, but also there's some political fallout from it. And there's, he has to do more jobs and he doesn't have the energy because he also needs the dream blood and he didn't get it in that time. And this sort of like the... Um, Yes, the old the old Jedi and the young uh, Padawan learner. I just watched Star Wars yesterday, so that's kind of in my head. And you you kind of go, oh right, so w- you know the, the dynamic between the two of them. And then as it goes on, you realise that oh, Ahiru has has gone through this beforehand because we also you know he mentioned his um, you know his master as well, and he's been through these steps and worked alongside his master. And now they're looking; they need someone to uh, you know come up and replace another gatherer because there should always be four gatherers, um, and they need some more going on there. Um, so yeah, I think that relationship is the heart of the story, is, uh, is what they do. They, they get together, they go on a mission, they've got to kill someone, and then they go across to another city, and we get the interplay of, oh, what, what is the view of them, and what is the view of Gajura in the, in the, uh, the next city over? Do they like that the gatherers are there? Um... The other, uh, another main character is the prince. I can't remember the prince, but he's he's the one with the five hundred wives or the hundred wives and lots of children, and he's very much the uh, Machiavellian villain of this, the conniving person in the background. Um, again, as he goes through, it's like, is he the main villain? Are there other villains, other other places? Is he pulling the strings, or other people pulling his strings? And Again, this was one of the points where it was such an interesting character, or there was, for me, a lot of interest in this character, and his view of the world, and this is one of those kind of things which always comes to me in these fantasy novels, like, okay, if you do live in a fantasy world, and if magic does exist, and there really are gods, and there really isn't the way that it is, sort of like, what is morality in that way? And I liked the brief, or the kind of, I wouldn't say brief, but too shallow for me, like, 
the, the beginning of the exploration of, okay, if gods really do exist, what is morality? If magic really does exist and can, and can cure this and can heal that, like, what is the, you know, utilitarian, uh, best utilitarian outcome of, to, you know, to use this in the best way uh, for the most, uh, the least suffering of for the most people? And what is it worth to get to that point? It was kind of played around the edges, but in this case, it was a bit too, it quickly summed up. I was like, oh yeah, but he's wrong. So let's just go over with these other people. Um, but an interesting, a fun character to spend time with. And this other character that we have here, oh, I've lost the character, um, Sundani. She is started off as an interesting character, but then almost disappeared for the second half of the book. She came along on a journey, but didn't really do much. Um, she was kind of more of a, like a, a, a balance for these other characters. She's an ambassador from another city and is over here in Gujarat and uh, has a, a, a price put on her head, the gatherers are sent to kill her, and she kind of gets out of it, I don't want to spoil it too much, but she gets out of it, and then the rest of the book is kind of like her dealing with the idea, oh, I should, you know, maybe I'm not going to survive, and other people going, oh, well, you're going to be gathered, whatever happens, because when the gatherers are going to gather you, they're going to do it. So her journey is, um, again, it starts out interesting, but it's, it never really paid off in the second half of the book. And this isn't the the first book recently. What was the other book that I read recently where it started off and there was this side character? I don't know, what was it? It was called um, Autonomous by Annalee Nevitz. And it's, there's this one character. In that case, it was a pirate character. And it's sort of like, oh, cool, pirate character over here. Yeah, okay. Well, she's, she's one of the main viewpoint characters. Right, let's follow along with her. And then halfway through the book, it's like these authors have suddenly gone, actually... Uh, these other characters over here and their relationship, that's really what the book is about. Okay, let's concentrate on them. But then this uh, this other character, in the case of Autonomous, the pirate character in here, um, Sundani, or whatever her name is, uh, let's have a look it up, yeah. Um, Sundani, it's, it's sort of like, oh, I forgot that there has to be some payoff for her character and she has to have a journey and do some stuff towards the climax of the book as well. And it, again, didn't really pay it off that well, unfortunately. But overall... Um, the, I really did like spending time with these characters um, and half of the characters were paid off really well and the other half were interesting but again wanted a little bit more payoff and uh, I don't know I really got that with N.K. Jemison's f uh, first book in the Broken Earth series I can't remember what it's called I should look that one up too the um, or was it just called the Broken Earth no what was it called um, do, 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 Broken Earth. Oh, I can't see. Whatever the first Broken Earth was. Oh, fifth season. Of course, yeah, the fifth season. So in the fifth season, all of those characters really paid off. And even the second book in the series, they all paid off. And it's so great to see characters paying off in that way. And in this case, it didn't really uh, pay off in the same way. Or 50% of the characters didn't pay off. And I'm not quite sure where those characters can go in the second book in this series. Um, overall, I've kind of been talking about this book as though like the things I didn't like but all of these kind of things it just I don't know this book is one that showed so much promise and I'm like N.K. Jemison has obviously got an amazing book in her and of course that is the uh, uh, fifth season <laughs> that was the book that is kind of building to with these first two trilogies or that's what it feels like going back to it it's sort of like all right she got some good stuff going on in the inheritance trilogy although I've only read the first book this book is sort of like oh the world building is getting there but the world building has to be clarified there has to be a bit more stuff a bit more interest it has to be either more different from earth or it has to be you know a bit more based in I don't know either more reality and reference those you know make those references stronger so we can pull the references in from our real world to you fill in the gaps or it has to be a completely new world and you've got to fill in all those gaps from the ground up and that's what she does in the broken earth and the killing moon uh, didn't quite get there and again the characters are like all oh, right you've got some good relationships here and you're gonna pay the, but you've got to pay all these off and then in the broken earth it does that However, this book is not a bad book. It's just, it was, I was just a little bit let down by the, um, uh, as I put here in my review on Goodreads, I was a le bit let down by the lack of complexity in the plot and its resolution. Maybe it gets more challenging in book two, question mark? Um, so book two, question mark? Maybe. We'll see. Um, but overall, I really enjoyed this book. And also, let me just look up the uh, narrator. Um, uh, the narrated by Sarah Zimmerman, good narrator. Uh, I really enjoyed it. She, it's uh, mostly male viewpoint characters and mostly male characters, um, but she did those really well. Uh, again, it's one of those, uh, 
I don't want it to be damning with faint, faint praise that, oh, what she didn't do was try and do low voices for the main male characters, um, which is uh, always a problem. But uh, no, very good narrator. And I'd be happy to uh, listen to her do another book. Unlike, as I said, the narrator of the, um, of the uh, first book, in the Inheritance Trilogy, which again, I can't remember, oh, 100,000 Kingdoms, where that was somebody who was like, oh, right, I've got to do a young voice. So she was just like, who do I know young? Ah, this kid down the street. And suddenly it's like, ah, gee, man, gee, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, that's, I don't really want, I I think I mentioned in the review, like, if you're going to have young actors, um, have have Joel Haley Osmond from The Sixth Sense with a kind of like more measured something rather than um, what's his face from The Phantom Menace, young Anakin. It's sort of like, no, 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 don't go for young Anakin, like over the top acting for a child, especially because in the Inheritance trilogy or in that first book, this young child character was actually a god who was thousands of years old. And he was like talking like, a, I don't know, a, it was just totally weird. And in this case, the the voices are much more me- measured. So Sarah Zimmerman, Sarah Zimmerman, a thumbs up there. Right. Um, yeah. Overall, I'm going to give this book three stars. It's not quite a three and a half star book, or four star book, or four and a half, or whatever I gave uh, the Broken Earth. Actually, let me go look back here. What did I? Um, what did I have set fifth season? Oh, four star book. Yes. And Obelisk Gate. What did I give there? Oh, I gave that book two stars. How did I give Obelisk Gate only two stars? I only have good memories from that book. Mainly it's because I guess a lot of the stuff was paid off in the final book. So I have fonder views of that. Anyway, three stars, um, above average. But unfortunately for N.K. Jemison, she has surpassed this. And it's a bit weird to go back and listen to this or like click into this book after reading the fifth season, which is actually just so much better. And let me let me have a look at some other friends. So Tudor rated it five stars. Excellent novel that works for me. Much better than 100,000 Kingdoms. I reviewed that back in 2012. So uh, let's see someone who's read it more recently. Oh, Judy Davis. The world building was much more interesting than the storytelling, which I could predict for the last third of the book. Yeah. It, it's one of those ways that I was like, oh, if this isn't going so good, I can predict this. So I hope she surprised me and then didn't surprise me. Um... Uh, Judy Davis, but after that there wasn't much equal credence given to both sides of the philosophical argument and the end of the book seemed like a cop-out to me. That is almost exactly uh, <laughs> that's almost exactly my thing. So I was like, oh, this is all good right, we're going to have, we're going to see this both, like there's going to be a war between, you know, good and evil, but evil has a point and there's some good stuff and the, on the good side they've got some real skeletons in the closet and there's something over there as well, so maybe they're going to come to a compromise and in the end it's not like I don't know, they said it's going you know, to uh, Veer rated it uh, uh, four stars, not as good as the Inheritance trilogy, and I had more difficulty getting into it than the first uh, than the first reading. Maybe because many of the point of, of the many point of views, but still good overall. I think that kind of sums up my thing. It's sort of like, yeah, good, it's, it's okay. It's I have issues, but still good overall. Um, yeah, so it's actually pretty highly rated. Three point eight six stars on Goodreads in general, and a three point eight eight average rating uh, of Friends of Luke on. Uh, Goodreads. So yeah, pretty good book, um, but um, didn't pay off in a way that I was wanting. Right, uh, what else am I doing? I think I've come to the end of the episode. I've did this completely without notes, and um, yeah, 22 minutes. Well, I guess another short episode. This is Luke from uh, a few minutes in the future. Uh, when I opened my uh, uh, phone to take a photo of the audio, me holding up the phone. As you see, the uh, album art of these podcasts is always me holding up the book or holding up the phone, showing it, or me, Juliana, talking about the book. And in this case, I was like, oh, let me open the file. And, and it started playing, and it started playing author's note. And I was like, oh, yes, I, I skipped the author's note at the start of this book. <laughs> And uh, often because the author's note, it, or there's a, like a preface or something, now a note from the author, and it's often written ages back and kind of assumes you've already read the book in some cases, or it's sort of like, oh, this is the foreword written by this other author about this, and it's sort of like, yes, this is a very important book because of this, and I was like, I always skip that just because it kind of taints my enjoyment or kind of, not. it's not even about spoilers, like I, I want to go in cold and just let the book speak for itself. Here, N.K. Jemison pretty much spends two minutes saying, what I've done is I've kind of removed as many references from these ancient Egyptian stories that I'm talking about now. And I, I tried to keep the name sounding kind of ancient Egyptian, but not really. And I'm uh, sorry if I've offended anyone. And I'm like, oh, that's exactly what was missing. This is exactly what I, because I skipped the author's note, the whole idea of the be, this being really clearly something about Egypt. She tells me 
outside of the story of the book, she's even saying, yeah, this is about Egypt, but I don't, just put it aside, it's tricky because I don't want to rely on those stories, I want to be really influenced by, that, by them, but I don't want to reference them too closely, and it's like, all right, so it's explained the book. Maybe if I'd have listened to the one and a half minutes of N.K. Jemisin saying, oh yeah, it's about ancient Egypt, but don't think too closely on that, I'm using it to influence me, but not too strongly, maybe I would have got it and enjoyed it a bit more. Um, anyway, there's Luke from a few minutes after recording the podcast. I don't often edit it, but that was so clear. That's exactly my main complaint, or one of my main complaints about the book. It doesn't mean I enjoyed it anymore, because I think that could there could have been a way of doing that within the text of the book, rather than just an author um, doing a director's commentary about it. But who knows? Anyway, uh, I thought that was interesting enough to come back and edit into this podcast um, two minutes after pressing stop. The next book that I'm going to be reading is... Uh, reviewing is I've got Paradox Bound by it's called Paradox Bound a novel by Peter Kleins and I've gotten about 50% of the way into that and suddenly what started off as I thought was going to be an interesting book has just become just tedious and pathetic and I'm not quite sure if I'm going to finish it off so maybe it's one of those ones it's one of those books I was like yeah I might as well finish it off because I've got it downloaded and it'll make an interesting podcast to talk about it but it's not bad enough to give any good rants about it so I'm just like well this, I'm just not enjoying this book very well I'll see uh, if people on Goodreads think it's worth continuing I can't even remember who recommended it to me um so that's the next book I'm also uh reading um The Caves of Steel by Isaac Asimov and me and Juliana will see if we can uh, review that although I am in South America in Lima in Peru at the moment and she's back in the UK maybe we can get on Skype and we can uh, um, record that via Skype, or maybe I'll just read it, uh, we'll review it once I get back to Berlin in January. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, that's it for me. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Luke Burridge. Become my friends on Goodreads, and I can see what you think of the same books that I'm reading. You can follow me on Instagram and YouTube and all these other kind of places. Also, check out sfbrp.com if you want to get the archive feed going all the way back to uh, episode number one. And uh, you can also check out the episode list where you can see um, every single book that I've read and reviewed, uh, along with the ratings, the series the book is in. By, you can sort by author or length of the podcast or date of the podcast and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I hope you uh, check that out too. sfbrp.com does have some stuff that you can, uh, resources that you can uh, find there. So that's it from me. Thanks a lot for listening and I'll catch you next time.